Welcome to another episode of Chefs and Guests on the Spoon Mob podcast. This is the first episode of 2022. We're going to have a lot more coming at you here. So this week I'm joined by Chef Stefan Medias, who is the chef owner founder of Wario's Beef and Pork here in Columbus, Ohio. If you've never heard of Wario's, they're known for these gigantic Philly cheesesteaks, essentially. They are huge to say the least, and extremely delicious too as well. The menu's got about like five, six sandwiches on it, and then they do a Saturday special, which kind of rotates. They've had different things like Moroccan lamb. Uh, they do a, like a pastrami one they've done before. They did a Korean kind of shaved pork shoulder one recently too as well. So usually the Saturday special it usually sells out probably within the first couple hours. Uh, they open at 11. They're usually probably sold out of the special by one. And then they usually sell out every day. I mean, they do probably anywhere from six to 800 sandwiches a day. They work with Mattia Breads and Matt Swint over there, uh, who makes all their, their bread for them. And, and it's an awesome sandwich. You know, definitely wanted to have Stefan on, was able to get him kind of scheduled towards the end of last year. And, and this is the first episode of 2022 that we'll be releasing a bunch more on the way. You know, he talks about growing up in Cleveland, how he wound up in Columbus, you know, working around different restaurants here in Columbus, kind of where the idea for Wario's came from, he even contemplated kind of quitting the industry too as well when COVID and everything happened. So we touch on that too. And and the inspiration for Wario's, where the name come from, how they decided on the sandwiches and the design and everything. So it's really in-depth, a really intuitive conversation about just awesome, awesome, delicious Philly cheesesteaks. So if you've never had one, make sure to get down there. They're pretty much open, I think, every day, except for like Monday or something like that. Pretty much 11 to like 7, I think, are their hours, right across from the Nationwide Arena in the Arena District there. They got a little walk-up window and you can kind of pop inside too as well. And they got a little counter in kind of this little small, I don't know if it's a shopping space or whatever it is. There used to be a sandwich shop too as well before they closed uh, probably a year and a half ago or so now, maybe two years. Make sure to check them out. You can follow them on Instagram uh, at Stefan Medias on Instagram and then also at Wario's Beef and Pork. You definitely want to make sure that you're following them just because of the Saturday special too as well. Every week that they release that, it's different. So they post it on Instagram. They also post, you know, when they're sold out or how many sticks that they got left, how many sandwiches they can make. So that way you're not, you know, calling to order and then find out that they're sold out. You can kind of keep track. Uh, they do a really good job of updating kind of their progress throughout the day on where they're at and how long they're probably still going to be there and be open before they sell out. So make sure to call to order to talk to them. They'll steer you in the right direction if you're unsure of where you want to go. But awesome food, awesome conversation. So without further delay, here is my conversation with Chef Stefan Medias, the owner, chef, founder of Wario's Beef and Pork here in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks again for taking some time out of one of your off nights. I'm assuming you were finishing up at the sandwich shop before doing this. So, but I know you guys are always busy on the weekends. I mean, I've had, you know, Wario's a handful of times. It's an awesome sandwich. We had this Zoom happy hour back in the days of Zoom happy hours uh, during COVID and everything. My wife wound up picking up a couple sandwiches. We were in the middle of happy hour. Everybody's drinking and everything. And I'm not really talking too much because I was eating a Wario sandwich. Everybody was just like, what are you eating? What is that? And then then I told them and they're like, that looks that looks really awesome. When you first opened, I mean, we'll get there, but like everybody either knew of you, like through word of mouth, or it was on like everybody's list of, I got to try that. I have to get down to the arena district. Like it really blew up that way. But I want to get to Wario's and all that stuff. You're originally from Cleveland, right? Yes, sir. Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up in uh, the Lindhurst Mayfield area. That, uh, that was the start. Came down to Columbus to uh, attend school at Ohio State. My brothers were also down here two years prior to that. So it was an easy move for me to come down here, be with my brothers. I got to live with them um, in co throughout college for a couple of years. And uh, it's really where I would say the professional cooking career began. Did you work in like restaurants before coming down to Columbus, like up in Cleveland, like first job in high school or anything like that? Actually, first job was a dishwasher at a local bakery called Casa Dolce on Mayfield Road, still there today. I believe it's the same owners or family of the owners that I was working for when I was there. The cliche story of every chef starts as a dishwasher. I fit the bill on that one, too. I was probably too young legally to be washing dishes in the state of Ohio, but Probably. I won't say what age. And uh, it was just a good family operation. And it was kind of a funny uh, occurrence. Like my father like handed me off 
on my first day over there. Ever since then, I've had a few jobs here and there, nothing too serious. Never thought at the beginning of sort of working in kitchens that it was going to be food for me. The passion really sort of like blew up and started to become reality. I was 21 that I decided that I like really, really wanted to take this seriously. But other than that, it was good jobs. What I knew how to do, I was always helping my family in the kitchen. It was just kind of like second nature, you know, big family, a lot of food. So we always just had tasks and we enjoyed it. The food's fun. Michael Rollman is a great food writer, counterpart to a good chef that a butcher that I got to spend some time under. He said, the power of food is amazing. And it truly is. So many different facets of that too. Did your parents like ever run a restaurant or anything like that? Like how did you first get into food? No, believe it or not, like I was came out of one of the only Greek immigrant families that <laughs> came over here that didn't we're on a restaurant group now. Every single, like my my Uncle John had a restaurant. My Thea Maros, my Aunt Maros' husband had a restaurant all growing up. My father, however, wasn't. He was an engineer and my mother was an esthetician. And they both still are to this day. So we didn't have like the obligatory like Greek family raised in the diner or hot dog cart on the, you know, side of the road type of thing. It was just the progression of, of the love of food, just everybody that came out of my house, at least 18 years old, my siblings, myself, and most of the most of our other close friends, they look a lot like the figure that you see in front of you. So food was, uh, was always a, a hot topic in our home. And like my mother is still to this day will be offended if you came into her home and didn't put a bite of food in your mouth, at least, you know, so food has always just been so pressing. So it's not surprising that I ended up where I am. But yeah, man, there was no influence for like professional cooking in our family. No, like culinary school wasn't never in the picture, like none of that stuff. When you moved down to Columbus to go to Ohio State, what were your original plans? I want to do some sort of business management. I definitely was leaning towards, you know, the hospitality side of things. Um, just being in the service industry, as many difficulties as people provide, especially in our line of work, like throughout the course of your career, just, you know, cooperation, new faces. I love being in the industry of people, man. And there's something about, you know, I reference my mother and, and her nature of giving as soon as you walk into the home from the time that you leave. It was just, it's just something that felt right, you know, dealing with people and just having a little bit of patience for a conversation in regards to, whether it be service or even selling a car, I feel like I would just be comfortable with it. You know, it's uh, it's just one of those things. People aren't that bad. It's not rocket science, you know? Like numbers scare me more than dealing with a person. As, m as much as you might think that's crazy, that's just how it is for me. It's just a practical way of dealing with things. So I'm assuming you got your degree and everything from Ohio State, right? I didn't finish completely with a degree. I went in there for, like I said, hospitality and business management was working two jobs really when I was a freshman, sophomore. Uh, they were both with the same company. One of them was a security job and the other one was I was a prep cook in the mornings. It was great and just kind of like getting comfortable and getting used to people in the back of the house rather than having to deal with, you know, this more service side of things, I think is really what made me fall in love with it for the most part. And then just like the technically driven, seeing you take like product that can, people are throwing away waste and turn it into something that you can appreciate and be proud of. And not only that, but turn a profit for your business. So it's a culmination of so many things, man. I, I can't even tell you what deviated me from school, but like finishing school wasn't a problem. It just, I also got to the point where I didn't have to go into any debt, like student loans. So like I had to make a decision on whether... I was going to start taking out loans to finish school. And then I was just like, you know what, man, screw it. Like, stick to what you know. And at the time, I was having fun and I was looking at it like I was getting paid to learn. It was a cool appreciation for, yeah, this sucks. It's really fucking hard work a lot of days. And they're long days. And i tell you the truth. Sometimes you look back at it and it's just like, how the hell did you even get here? But it's determination and self-will. And just like I said, man, you got to find a way to enjoy it. It feels much different now, work with the two i don't even know scrunch fingers that like as people say work now uh, in comparison to how it used to be but it's all a grind we all have to serve our role so this one just so happened to be mine 
So you were going to college, you know, you're going for the hospitality kind of management program is what it sounds like. And you're working two jobs and then you basically are just kind of like, you know, college thing, like it's the point, like you said, where you're, you got to either take out some loans or whatever. Do you remember that moment when you're like, yeah, I want to be a chef. That's what I want to pursue. I never really like used the word. Like I, I knew I wanted to cook. Butchery was more appealing to me than anything. And I really thought that that's what I was going to do and stick with. But then you learn butchery and you learn how there's like no, like there's no shortcuts in butchery. Like you, if you're butchering, you know, an animal, you got to use the whole animal and you got to be the corner sweeper, not the corner cutter, as they would say. There's no shortcuts in butchery. And another way that, again, to reference Brian Paulson, he always said a good butcher is a good cook. The breakdown and the raising and the you know, the whole process of just an animal's life, the drama behind all of it. And then you have a responsibility afterwards to make sure that that life wasn't for nothing, right? And that we're using every bit of it that we can. So there was some beauty in that process to me. And that's sort of like the first rabbit hole that I went down. For some reason, like I was brought up with like other chefs who you had to do it the old way, man. Like, yeah, we were working. And we had a salary that might have said that we were supposed to be working 50 to 55 hours a week. But any chef that's running a restaurant that's busy or multiple restaurants that's busy knows that 50 or 55 hours a week doesn't cut it, especially with the environment and the demographic that was, you know, that you're provided with in the service industry. There's not a lot of college graduates and valedictorians in the kitchen, my friend. There's many, you know, addicts, dropouts, and, uh, large characters with a bit of an organized chaos mentality on life. So at no point in time did being a chef sound like fun. I will say that the food is what was like the, the final driving force is like, okay, like, you know, there's an endless door of opportunity of new things to learn constantly in this industry. And I think I can work my way up to where I want to be at a pretty decent pace. If I just keep my head down and be responsible and show up every day on time and have a brain in between my ears rather than a bunch of hot air and and stale booze. So like I said, everything's a culmination of dedication and discipline. But in the end of it, I don't know what was like, I don't know if there was like an aha moment. I I would say no, I I can't remember that. So then from there, this is kind of like the part where it's really hard to find what happens next. So I mean, I think at one point you worked at Ethel and Tank. Ray Ray's, you also pop up at two, I think, right? Somewhere in there? First, I was a prep cook at the Crest. So I was working security at Midway. And then I was a prep cook at the Crest the first year that it opened. I was leading prep. And that first year, year one and year two of the Crest is like a good indicator of where I like cut my teeth as far as like learning techniques, using a knife in a, in a fast manner, like in a comfortable way as well. but. I never went to culinary school. I had no classic training. I'm trained by, yes, some people who went to culinary school, but for the most part, we're just a bunch of a group of rugged guys, man. Everybody making it work. We had a chef that had some experience overseas and in some other places, Dustin Bradford, but we never like this like fine or refined way of, of learning anything. It's just kind of like go. You're working at the Crest. And like you mentioned, you're pretty much self-taught, like never went to culinary school. What would you say if somebody came into your kitchen now at Wario's? I know it's, it's everybody in that kitchen is somebody that you've known for a while and, and have hired personally. But if they came in and were like, hey, you know, I, I really think like I want to open a restaurant on my own one day. I was thinking about going to culinary school. I know you didn't, but what are your thoughts on that? I would encourage them to work. I would ask them first if they had, how long they had worked in a professional setting in a kitchen what the longevity of that was and to encourage them first to take the time to really sort of put themselves out there and go work something in the industry called a stage. I'm sure you're familiar. And, you know, as a chef, if you want to learn, you just go and do a kitchen or apply to work in places to work for free just to learn. I would implore them to do something like that or just go get a job and see if they can handle and enjoy, find a way to enjoy that environment first. Because You can have all the technique in the world and you can have all the knowledge in the world. But if you can't put it on a plate when it's time to put it on a plate, then culinary school doesn't do anything for you. That is the only thing that 
that I think that more culinary programs should encourage is externships for a good portion of, you know, of the program to be in a kitchen on a line. You've never seen, I, I have never met a chef that came out of culinary school and was the executive chef of a place right away. You know what I'm saying? They've had to, after that, go through programs and work at different places. It's just, there's so, there's so much of like a respect hierarchy that you have to earn in the kitchen. It's just such an old way of doing things. And that's also part of the alluring thing for me. I like the old way of doing stuff, man. The word of mouth, let them talk or if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of guy. After the crest, you're there for like a year or two, right? And then from there, do you go to Ethel and Tank and then Ray Ray's? Or how does all that come together? Because eventually you wind up back with A&R Creative Group. So it was the crest, work and prep. Then we opened up Ethel. Then we opened up the market in Italian Village. So I went crest, Ethel, market, Ethel, part-time, both places. And then we had a place that we were managing and had a big prep facility back there called Cafe Del Mundo. I don't know if you ever remember that building. It's where they used to hold the Italian festival. It was on um, 4th, right under the bridge where you get on the 70. That empty plot on your left, when you're going to get on 670, there used to be a big building there. And there was a little cafe to the left. You know, when you first walked in, it's called Cafe Del Mondo. And in the back was this big warehouse. And we had big walk-in coolers and like a fucking bakery oven and a huge prep facility. And I was in charge of managing the prep for those restaurants at least the like the big bulk prep i had a team of like 10 or 12 people in there and we would prep everything like we'd get the orders from the chefs prep everything there treat it like a commissary basically and then deliver all the prep to said places in the morning so i was doing that while i was kind of like chefing a little bit at the market and i was still helping a creative sort of way at ethel and tank and then we opened up crest two on parsons and I was there for a little while for the opening as uh, some support role for Julian uh, Menajad, who was the chef there. I learned so much from that guy. Also, Justin Watring. I said Dustin's name already. We'll talk about Tyler Menace, I'm sure, down the road. John Fuller. These are just the guys that we did. I did all this with throughout the course of time. I think I was there for the longest, other than Justin is still with that company, I believe. But yeah, so it was Crest 2. So I covered OG, Ethel, Market, Crest 2. Alchemy was over there. I had very little to do with Alchemy in comparison to the rest of them. Had almost nothing, to tell you the truth, now that I can remember it. So far, it was somewhere in the mix over there. That was at the beginning, a culmination of Julian, John, and Justin. And I was playing a support role in and out of it. There were so many different places. And then I landed back at the market after all that. And I was, then I was at the market. So that was over the course of like four years, all that, maybe five. And then I was at the market for like three years until 2018. And I was at the market first with Julian. And then Julian took off to do uh, and take another opportunity. Then I was there solo as a chef. And then we got uh, my boy Tyler Menison. I was asking for another person to learn from and work with just because it was getting difficult to help manage and be a creative for multiple places. And uh, Tyler and Evan Jones as well in that kitchen. We all clicked really well. There's a bunch of other great guys that were there for over the course of the years. And like we bounced them around from kitchen to kitchen. But man, it was quite a ride with that company, dude. I mean, we moved and we moved fast and everybody was hustling and there was. 100 plus hour weeks month after month after month and uh let's see at some point i was at the market i think then i got moved to the crest yeah so you eventually you become executive chef at the crest but when you first start and like you said you're in the support role where you're like you're in the commissary but then you, you know you're over at the first crest and then you're over here and you're over there and you're every week you're kind of just bouncing around all these different places it seems you know, a lot of chefs don't have to do that. Like a lot of chefs, when they work at a restaurant, they just go to that restaurant, right? So you're kind of bounced around all these places. How do you keep that straight? Is it better for a chef, you think, because you're always kind of on your toes on the fly? No, I don't think it's better. I, think I don't encourage that for anybody, really. That was a tough balance, man. But I was young and eager. And, you know, again, to circle back to the viewpoint of what I saw, you know, man, like I'm not, I wasn't the guy that was out drinking really ever. 
you know, so I always had fresh legs and I was ready to rock. Like, yeah, I went out and partied when it was when it was time to have a good time and stuff. But that wasn't like my regular routine and alibi. So shit had to get done, you know, and I wasn't in the position. I don't think mentally were like, I, I don't really don't like attention. So I was fine being the support role. I knew what I did. So did the people that worked around me. And I think that's why I had very little friction and I'm confident to say that I was able to give the respect that I received and I earned, uh, you know, that as a reciprocating thing. But it was tough, dude. But I didn't want to be the front lead guy. I still don't really deal with the attention or the any of that stuff that well, because I'm going to be honest with you, dude. There's been a lot of people that have come in the kitchen and I'm sure in many other professions, but just all the time talking about this and I can do that. And I, there's another factor to drive you towards uh, cooking. So you can talk as much shit as you want, but until it's time for, for you to put it on the plate, once again, we'll see what, what you're really capable of. And that pressure and that tempo and being able to manage all those different things, it's part of being a chef. So if you want to be a chef, then you've got to put yourself through the ringer, as I'd like to say, or something but no i don't encourage anybody to do any of that that's why i have one place now and you don't see me rushing to open three four five and six in the next five years you know probably have the bandwidth and the experience to do it but it's just not something that's that's very interesting to me as a matter of fact like i went completely opposite man i have five items on my menu coming from restaurants with menus with 20 plus items on every single one you know we fed or tried to appease to to almost any anybody that could walk into that door. So, you know, there's beauty in the balance of that and the management of that. I'd rather just sell five sandwiches, man. We're having fun doing that. I left the crack and I went to Ray Race because I was needed a change of pace. And I looked at it as I was going to sharpen another tool or gain another tool into the industry that I first came into the business for. And it was sort of the butchery like meat and uh meat accessories game james anderson what a guy great friend of mine look up to him most of my pork recipes are tailored to his pigs been proud to support and serve the animals that he raises on that farm for many years and i think i'm one of the few on his list that has those available to me because he's downsized quite a bit to focus on higher quality which is ridiculous to even think about than it was. But yeah, man, I joined James and I learned from James. I learned from Dan Varga while I was in that company and many other people. Jess, James' wife is an incredible lady, very welcoming. And my stint with Ray Ray's was great. The ending factor to Ray Ray's was for me, I was still at this, you know, I'm, I think I was 26 at the time. 26 or 27, it's 2018. So no, it's 2018. So I wanted to explore food more, you know, and we were doing American barbecue. And speaking from having my own business now, it's important to stay in your lane and know what you should be serving. And I was itching to do other things. It would have been selfish for me to like try to make James and his brand uh, widen his lane for my itch because he built that company with his two hands and there's no reason anything should have changed. And I had too much. I have too much respect for it. So I kind of took off the same time that Varga. I think Varga was moving down to Florida when his wife was ill. I need to figure it out. I was welcomed back to A and R Creative, and I took on the crest again. And we made some changes, and we we played around with the with smoking some different meats over there, and you know, out of respect for. James and what happened over there. I didn't want to pull up in Clintonville and start serving American barbecue over there because I learned a thing or two from him. So, you know, we got creative with it. I learned the technique. And, you know, like I said, it was another tool for me to have. Always understood the basics of it because charcuterie has kind of always been my game. That was it. And then throughout all of that, uh, during my time at the market, I was traveling with uh, Brian Paulson for a little while, assisting and uh, teaching some butchering seminars in uh, some different places around the country. And that was probably the, my favorite part of my career so far, being able to do that. 
So in this time frame, I mean, the first time, like, you're working with Tyler, who's, he's over at the lobber now. He kind of took the market. So, like, Julian kind of, like, opened the market, and then Julian went on. He was the chef at Barcelona. I'm not sure if he's still over there with COVID and all that stuff, but he was there at, at one point. So he opens it, and then, like, Tyler takes it, and then Tyler does, like, the No Menu Monday thing, which is kind of almost, like, transforms the market, takes it to, like, the second level Every Monday was so fun for us. Like we'd go in there and just like literally look at the coolers up and down and like we're gonna start writing the menu. Sometimes it would be a full collaboration. Sometimes you'd walk into the shop and like Tyler knew what he wanted to serve or we knew from the day before what we were gonna be serving and like we all got to put things together. Tyler, Evan Jones and myself. And usually the three of us worked Mondays and like dude it was so much fun. It was Tyler's brainchild, and he led us um, in that endeavor, but that was so much fun, dude. Yeah, for like a long time, it was like almost like the best kept secret, like in Columbus. Yeah, it wasn't that busy. Mondays weren't that crazy busy. It was manageable for three. Towards the end, it it exploded because like when we started going and we would go like every Monday because they would post like the handwritten menu at like five. So you'd be like refreshing Instagram to see like, did they post it yet? Did they post it yet? What's on there? You know, there's a decent amount of people in there, but it was never packed out or something. And then like towards the end before COVID and everything, like, like I remember one time we went in there and it was like, we're lucky we got here like when we did, because 15 minutes later, like every table was like full. And like, it really turned into this event thing and nobody else was really open on Mondays and stuff. So it was, we always had a blast there. But when you wind up becoming the executive chef at the Crest, you know, it's like your first executive chef job. What were like the biggest challenges with that? Because I mean, you already kind of knew the system, you know, with that restaurant group and everything, but you're still running the show at that place. It was just the title, man. You know, I, I hate to say it, but nothing felt abnormal. The biggest challenges were always people. And, and keeping reliable ones and just being able to spend time on training and grooming someone to understand the technique so that the product comes out. Because every pork belly is different. Every tomatoes, everything's different every day of the week. Sometimes you got to make those adjustments on the spot. I think that was the biggest challenge is getting people to understand that the education that I was passing on, that was passed on to me, that was came from somebody else, like, is the most important part about why we're there and you're getting paid to do it. There's a level of gratitude that I have for those who have something to share, especially knowledge. And the biggest obstacle for me was just like, what the, f like some people is just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, like, I know you hear me, but are you listening? Like, what the hell's going on? That's the most frustrating part. I wasn't really surprised by it. I mean, I've had people call off work because, you know, kid called me one time, say, hey, chef, I'm not coming in tonight. It's just, hey, what's up, buddy? What's the problem? He goes, I just fed my pet snake uh, 15 minutes ago and snake's got to stay in the feeding cage for an hour before I move him back to the other cage. The guy's trying to tell me he's calling. I was like, so you're calling off of work because you're fucking snake? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I have to wait. It'll go. It'll be bad. I was like, dude, I was like, dude, you better be at work at five o'clock or you don't got a job tomorrow morning type of thing. You know, it's just like, come on, man. Like, so I think it's always the, the largest obstacle is the biggest variable. And it's, it's people and understanding and trying to be patient and remember that you are in a place to not only organize and be a leader, but be a creative. And sometimes, yeah, it feels like you're more like a camp counselor with a clipboard, but it's part of it, man. And uh, I think that, that's probably the, the highest difficulty for most people. We had a small space to do things, but we made it work, man. Everybody was a bunch of hustlers, so uh, it worked out. All credit goes to every team that I have ever worked with, even even the ones that might have been the most difficult. Nothing gets put on a plate and translated without the, the help of people. Nothing great happens alone. So shout out to anybody that was patient enough to deal with my crazy ass for all those years and years to come. But so when you start working at Ray Ray's, were you into charcuterie before that? Or was that kind of like where that kind of love affair first started? Because you wind up doing like you mentioned that you, you link up with Brian Paulson and wind up he wrote kind of like one of the books on charcuterie. And that guy is the Michael Jordan of pork that that guy is that I mean, as far as having a teacher and knowledge. He's at the top of the list. I want to be able to do what he was able to do for 
my generation and the one prior to me as well for the next two. I want to be able to teach butchery. I want to be able to, because people now are saying like charcuterie has made a comeback. Charcuterie is the oldest technique of preservation of proteins. There was salt before refrigerators, people. If anybody's listening to this, just remember that charcuterie is not a trend now. It's been a thing for a long time, and it, it's a beautiful symphony of salt in the best versions pork. Uh, educate yourself if you don't know about that. It's a pretty incredible thing. Charcuterie, the love for charcuterie started for me in 2013. What was that? What was so? I was working at the Crest, and we were doing charcuterie boards, and like just being able to be educated by this gentleman from Agora Foods. It's actually a good friend of my father's. His name is George Conzios. And this man is like an encyclopedia for cheese and meats. And when I would order and ask about new things and talk to him about stuff, he made it a point that every single thing that he told me about had a story behind it. And I think it, part of it comes from I'm comfortable speaking with people. I'd rather just be quiet and work most times. But when it's time to talk, I'm, I'm all right to have a good conversation with those who want to listen and who've asked for it. But George taught me so much about just really the nerdiness started geeking out for cheese. And then like the highest compliment to it is those are those properly cured meats and hearing the stories, understanding the process, seeing that it wasn't a popular thing and knowing why. It's just because it's it's ball busting work, man. It's heavy work. Like butchery is not for somebody who doesn't want to get their hands dirty. It's it's a it's a serious gig, and those types of things sort of draw me to want to know more and why aren't we doing and why aren't we using and why is are these products so limited? Why are more people using them? This is you know one of the best things. I I mean I grew up in a home of the salted meats and cheeses and, and all that kind of stuff anyways. So like it's been part of my diet for a long time. It's either I'm going to be here for a really long time because of all that preserved stuff or I'm going out with a bang. But either way, the charcuterie is in the, in the picture for me. I said 2013 conversation with George and still to this day, I talk to George every, I'd say every other week. When I got a question about a couple of products, if I want them to bring something in, anything that we can't make or facilitate, but you know, for the most part, it's been uh, pedal to the metal from there. So, where did the idea for Wario's come from? The name or the sandwich shop? I have a question on the name because I know the name is you're a big Nintendo guy. You would always play Wario as your character. Why did you always gravitate towards Wario? I don't know. I guess I'm kind of look like Wario to, as if I was a video. game. No, um, you know what, man? I don't know what made me like Wario. There's something, uh, you know, I'm the my brothers are the bro, you know, the the good brothers. They finished school, they made mom and dad proud. I'm not, I'm not saying that I didn't make mom and dad proud because I don't think they would they would say that. But they finished school. They did. You know, I'm kind of I'm the middle child. I'm kind of like the the black sheep, evil brother, I guess. You know, in some some ways, but with good intentions. I promise just the way that I guess I have of doing things can be a bit disruptive. As far as that goes, like, I think I've been honest about this with, with the gentleman on the meat bucket as well and uh, upper feast, but we're sitting in my brother's garage in Menor, Ohio, and we're passing something around. And one of my cousins, Charlie was wearing a, a Mario Kart shirt. And I had, we had been throwing these names around for what we were going to call the sandwich shop myself. And, partner in the endeavor nate burley's was a name and the, i was gonna call it some cheese ball italian like my boss name but beef and pork so it would have been like i don't know it had been like something corny then i was like looking at his shirt and i was like you know what that's it and they go what and they go, wario's beef and pork and they go, come on man get the fuck out of here and i said i swear to god man we're calling the sandwich shop wario's beef and pork i'll never forget the next day i was driving i think it was 90 in cleveland uh, over dead around dead man's curve as soon as i got around the turn i called my business partner nate i was like, just want to let you know i think i'm we're calling the sandwich shop wario's beef and pork and he said like the video game he laughed you know the video game guy is like yeah man wario's beef and pork he goes i was like but we're not gonna do the yellow and purple we're gonna stick to the black red and white and he's like he's like i don't know he's like what if nintendo comes after us he's like good That'll be a good thing if Nintendo comes after us. Well, I mean, whatever. If we establish ourselves 
and Nintendo somehow says that we have to. It's my uncle, for the record. There you go. So uh, if they tell us we got to shut it down, we'll change the name, whatever. But that's it. And the opportunity itself was presented through Nate, who was in conversation of the space with the previous owner. The one who connected the dots was actually a good friend of mine, uh, Brian, who's uh, owner of uh, Head Shop uh, on Parsons Gallery, uh, Hetty's Hideout. And he put, he, you know, knew Nate and knew me and said, uh, hey, this guy needs help doing the restaurant thing. He's never done a restaurant thing before. And I told him, I was like, well, I'm out of the restaurant thing. He goes, yeah, well, there's no servers and things like that. I don't think it's just a sandwich shop. And I went there to see the space and I saw all the opportunity around it. I mean, there's only 150 to $240 million of infrastructure built in that arena district down there, not including the crew stadium in that fee, in that price uh, estimate there. And uh, just like, yeah, if we make good food and do things how we know how to do it, there's no reason why we can't be successful. Cook like how I always cook, man. You know, everything from the beginning, no shortcuts. And that was Wario's. It happened in about four weeks. Honest to goodness. I didn't know what I was going to do. COVID hit, out came Wario's. So were you out of the restaurant game just because of COVID or were you kind of like, uh, I might be done with this career? I almost was done with this career period, but it was before I had, it was before COVID. There was a point in time where I was like fucking fed up, man. That was, that was it. It was nine, 10 years. I didn't have too much to show for it. I mean, I know that we all get uh, massive salaries as chefs. I was kind of feeling down about things, man. And, you know, the what I had learned and what I was passionate about for a little while was just like, oh, like, it's always going to be like this to get. It's easy to make 10 plates of food, but when you got to do it over and over and over again, the change of hands and the change of people, that's what really makes things difficult. So at some point, I like look myself in the mirror. Like, Is this really what you want to be doing for the rest of your life? Like, constantly on your feet, hot in the kitchen. And yeah, dude, I just a couple of bad things happened. Almost quit cooking, period. I almost went back to Cleveland and sell cars with my uncle because I, just, I think I would have been all right at that. And then I don't know what, like dangerous up against the ropes you never know how you're gonna use them you know and uh i found my way out of that one and kept my head down kept waking up every day and pushing my pile and somehow i reevaluated my decisions and realized why i got into cooking and just kept moving forward it's tough man i mean it, you got to deal with your personal problems and problems of the restaurant the problems of your owners if you had if if any problems were there you know you you develop relationships with people the personal problems of everybody in the kitchen and the front of the house and the, I mean, dude there's so much there is just so much to being the the person to respond to everything so it's not surprising when you hear people don't want to cook anymore because of what it takes to get it out there and be successful in our industry because you got to sell a good volume of food to make money man it's i wish it was easier but it's not so we're here so when the opportunity with warios comes about and you're kind of teetering on getting out of the industry when you first looked at that space did you instantly know it was going to be a sandwich shop because it was already i think like arena district sandwich co or something like that or were you just kind of out on like american cuisine new style cuisine and stuff and you want to do something different you know at the beginning i really wasn't that into it i was using it i was gonna like consult for this dude like i told him i'd write him a menu i'd stay in here for a few months and i'll teach you guys how to do it and whatever because i had planned on going back to the company that i was working with after we all got put on unemployment for when covid hit so it was a, it was a few weeks into it and like I was, I told my, I remember telling my brothers like, yeah, I'm consulting for this guy who wants to have a sandwich shop. Like, yeah, I don't know about how much work they're really going to want to put into it, but I don't want to put my name on something that's just going to be a bunch of bullshit. Like every other sandwich shop serving frozen steakums and whatever the hell bread that they got from their broadliner, you know. And then I started like writing this menu and this was like five probably weeks into COVID because I had agreed to help him out. We didn't agree on a price or anything. I was just happy that I had something to do that I knew how to do, you know? And I told him I'd keep it simple and everything. I started writing this menu and I was like, man, are they going to do this, do that? 
And then I went in there one day and rolled out a few items for them and, you know, was testing th- different things and was really happy with stuff. And I just told him, I was like, dude, I'm going to be honest with you. He's like, I don't know how, like, if you don't know how to cook, like, I don't know who's going to be in here to manage this thing, but it's got to be somebody who really wants to be here. A couple of things happened and I didn't see myself going back to work where I was because I just didn't want to deal or know really how we were all going to deal with restaurants with COVID and just didn't want to deal with like having to send everybody home because labor was too high and you're the only one in the kitchen for a while because we're doing kit just all kinds of that all that kind of shit I just didn't want to deal with it anymore so I was just like it's sandwich time you know I've always wanted to have a deli and a butcher shop and I wanted to make fresh bread there and I wanted to serve sandwiches over the counter as the lunch time and have fresh meats and smoked and cured meats and you know that old vibe and getting to know your customers and their family. And just, it just brings back some nostalgia for me from some delis and and markets that I went to as a kid, as a teenager, and even as an adult, when I go back, just makes you feel good. That type of experience. So I saw an opportunity to recreate that with this little 500 square feet on nationwide. And my buddy, Nate, the business partner, he, after after the first couple of times that I made him some food, he was like, all right, you do whatever the hell you need to do. And you let me know how I can be here to support. And he's been amazing at, at helping learn the business and be in there every day. And everybody in that building can do everything. And that's the coolest part. So, you know, he wants to be there. He wants to learn the business and he's helping keep it a success. And I honestly, dude, it, this thing happened in like four weeks. From the time that I started writing the menu to when we were actually like serious about it, because that's how fast. That's crazy to think about. Did you do any like research on obviously your most famous sandwich is essentially a cheesesteak, but I think a lot of people would probably call it a Philly cheesesteak, which is not right because you're not in Philly. Philly's a very unique style. So did you even go out to Philly just to like do some research or had you been there before already or? I had been there before. I had done my R&D. There's a few of my favorite spots. I think um, comparably mine is the closest to a pizza shop, actually. It's called Angelo's. I think the big difference were it's not so much like a flavor thing, but the bread selection for people serving sandwiches is very poor. The decisions that are made when it comes to bread, I think, is your make or break moment with a sandwich. And Angelo's makes theirs fresh in house, and it's a very similar uh, modeled style roll of semolina. Actually, our roll, our sticks of semolina, are designed after Parisi Bakery in New York. It's one of the most OG bakeries that services a uh, greater part of New York City's uh, sandwich ga- sandwich shops with with the right stuff. So um, I would say Angelo's inspiring uh, business, the next for the roasted pork. We didn't reinvent the wheel, obviously. We didn't build a better mousetrap. We're just doing classics from scratch. It's goofy to see the difference for most people, but your reference point of food is what you think it is, you know? So if you went to Philly and you got this soft, steamed fucking roll and it was not crispy on the outside and it was very white and tight bread with no crumb and no character and, you know... You got whiz cut out of a can and steak that was rolled off of what looks like a t-shirt press and and put in a, you know, put with some cornmeal and cornstarch to bind it together. Then that's your reference point of a Philly. And you might not have had it in Philly. You might have had it somewhere else. And that's okay. We're just cooking the way that we feel is the right way to cook. And I think you start with good bread, you use good meats, you make things from scratch. It's going to be good if if you care about it, you know? And I think that, uh, it, like I said, man, it re- really, really has, has surprised me the way that the community has supported us, especially with only five items on the menu. It's quite ridiculous, actually, because I've spun my tires in the mud making all kinds of ridiculous contemporary cuisine over my career. Five sandwiches that the world's all seen at some other facet of a business anywhere here get some attention. So it's gratifying, especially because of the way that people have shown us support and the time that we decided to open a business. But it's still goofy to me, man. We're just making sandwiches. So with the menu being as small as it is, like you said, five sandwiches, I think there's 
two side options, maybe like a couple add-ons. I think you can get like peppers added on and, and whatnot. Was that decision just for efficiency purposes based on like the square footage of the space? Like you can only do so much in there or was it just like, let's start here. And if we ever want to expand on that menu or what was kind of the, the logic behind keeping it as small as it is? I think it's safe to say that the menu won't expand. Saturday will always be my day to play, but I don't know. Again, I came from a world of 20 plus menu items on all these menus and being able to focus on the few things that we do and go through the volume of it that we do on a daily basis gives us two huge benefiting things. Number one, the quality and the consistency tied into one are usually spot from the last time that you came there. We all taste everything a good majority of the day. If there's any variance, it's going to be in things that are more delicate, like bread. The weather is going to affect bread in many different ways and where it's being made and transportation, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a couple other factors, but everything is so fresh because of that. You know, because we don't have like, I don't have to worry about having 10 menu items and like three of them aren't moving that well. And then now I got all this waste and the shit's been taking up real estate in my cooler and not moving. And so it's part, partially both of those things. It helps us keep fresh quality, helps us focus on the, on doing a few things well, rather than trying to appease everybody. Because yes, I know our motto is everybody eats, but the reality of it is, is that we're not here to please everybody. Everybody is a long list. How did you wind up partnering with uh, Matt Swint? Of Matia Breads. He's been making bread for me for a while. Other restaurants. I've been buying his focaccia for years. I've been serving sandwiches on his focaccia for years. Uh, he's a good friend. He's a great mentor. His dedication to his craft is truly inspiring. And uh, he's an old school guy, man. It's the way that I want to be. I know I'm a, I'm a young buck in the group right now, but I just have much appreciation and, and, and I gravitate towards people who already took the path that I'm working my way through and you know they're still working their way through as well but you, know, you gravitate and have uh, mutual respect for people like that and I love his bread I wish every restaurant in this city could serve Matt's bread I really do I think they should but his operation is not big enough yet and you know I know we're all working on it together and there's going to be hopefully opportunity for us all if any expansion opportunity presents itself for Wario's and uh, we got to grow with the bread man too. I've enjoyed my time. I get to spend some time in the bakery with Matt from time to time and get in there and get my hands dirty. And I mean, it all started with a bread recipe years ago that I was playing around with trying to get the semolina stick to Columbus, Ohio, because nobody was fucking serving it here. And I was sick and tired of seeing sandwiches in New York that I have eaten and different places that I've gone and, thinking about, yeah, I can make all the meats in the world, but we, we can't have, nobody makes this bread, nobody makes anything close to it here, what the hell is wrong? It, it's not rocket science. So I started playing around one day and then a few good conversations with Matt led to about a month and a half of us not talking to each other and then him showing up one day with the bread, almost exactly where it was supposed to be. And it was just like, dude, you fucking did it. You can produce this at a, at a scale. And he was like, yep. I was like, all right. It started with like 80 sandwiches a day and uh, it's, the rest is history. So everything's done fresh daily, right? Like all the butchery and everything, obviously Matt's bread's done. Is it basically the allotment of sandwiches that you can make depends on how much you have of whatever that day, right? Yeah, usually we're, since we have the same and few menu items, I can keep the proteins that we need in house. And if we need to have things sliced and butchered or whatever on the fly that stuff's no problem but we have a part and i order a certain amount of bread every day and if we don't use the bread that day that means that something else has to be done with the bread so i try to get as close as possible every day getting our par right for what we order for bread so when we run out of bread we're closed there's no backup bread i'm not buying bread from anybody else if matt calls me tomorrow morning and says hey dude I fucking threw out my back. I don't have anybody to help me at the bakery. This guy called off sick, whatever, whatever. You're not going to get bread tomorrow. Guess what? We're closed. You know, I, I won't sacrifice that because it's half the battle for me. And again, it's a collaborative effort between him, his uh, years of knowledge and my uh, intentions and, you know, practice in the business as well. And again, it shows you that, you know, with the right 
intentions and a direction. We This market can produce anything. It just needs the people who want to produce it. So with your Saturday specials, how do you decide on the sandwich? Obviously, that's the day that you get to be creative since the menu's not going to expand anymore beyond the, the five sandwiches. So how do you decide on what you want to do that day? It's not a traditional like test ground. Well, if it sells really well on Saturday a bunch of times, like maybe we'll put it on the menu. Like obviously that's not going to happen. No. And eventually I'm sure we'll get to a point where, you know, if there is expansion and I'm, I'm needed in other buildings and other places, there'll be highlighters like ones that went well that I'll standardize that we'll be able to you know, run on Saturdays. If there was a Saturday that I wasn't there and, you know, I just didn't have the time or the bandwidth that week to get a, a new special out, you know, I'll put some of these other ones in my pocket. But Saturday special is number one factor of Saturday special. It can't funk with the flow. So if it's something, we've never had a Saturday special that gets cooked on the flat top. Let's just put it that way. Or has 100% put in the fryer because I don't want to compromise our speed and how we do things because of an extra sandwich um so that's the number one thing it's gotta like fold in it's gotta the brigade's gotta be able to run the way that it's supposed to um that's number one number two dude sometimes i find out tonight what i want to serve i again i've been fortunate enough to work with so many people and i cannot tell you how many hours i've spent in the kitchen and at home studying and practicing just the the center of the plate or the, the main of the sandwich, the proteins, you know. So I'm very comfortable with proteins and learning from all the different types of chefs, the Tylers and the Julians and the Dustins and the Justins and like all those guys, like, and all the other line cooks that I've worked with. Like, you get to see how people's styles are and stuff. And if you remember enough and you learn how to play with flavors and plug and play, then like making a special can be kind of fun. Sometimes I can get dressed out a little bit. It's whatever I feel like doing. I've tried out a lot of new things, I guess, like techniques. Like I had never made carnitas, like authentic carnitas up until this year. Like that's one that like I was driven to like want to do the classic like Manteca cooked, you know, lard cooked uh, carnitas. And you know, yeah, I didn't make tortillas or anything and do the masa. But I think every special will always be served on that roll, like the one that we serve or a modified version of it maybe a flavoring or something inside of there. But for the most part, man, it's special. is just like, really? It was one of the guys pushing me. He's like, dude, Zeferino, one of my main cooks, one of my first cooks that I hired in there. He's a little Hispanic, dude. He's like pushing me. He's like, come on, chef. Like, you know, I know you know how to cook. Like, Let's go, bro. Like, make a, make, a, make a special or something. Like, we're good. He was like, tell me he's like bored of making these five sandwiches that he was making. Dude, we're selling a lot of sandwiches, man. Come on, you're busy over here. Part of it was I was getting razzed a little bit and I was getting bored a little bit with some of the stuff. And we wanted to provide some excitement for the weekend day of the week and not just have only the five same things. So it's turned into something that's pretty cool, dude. And I can't believe it. I wish people would like chill out a little bit. I hate sending people. I hate when the phone rings and we got to tell people we're out of the special and then they don't like don't want anything to eat because of it. And it's just like it's understandable. Because hopefully that means that they're one of our customers and they just wanted to try the new thing for the week. But it's really goofy, dude, seeing people line up for a freaking sandwich. It's still goofy to me. You know what I'm saying, man? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's always weird. I mean, I remember when we went to New York City and we went to the Dominic Cancel's Bakery, does the Cronut, right? They changed the flavor like every month. They had a little like signpost out, basically, like if you were here for the Cronut, you're on this line. If you're here for anything else, and doesn't even matter, like you, if you're here for to buy every single other item in the bakery except for the Corona, you can be in this line. And it was just kind of wild because I mean, you know, they're like, oh, it's like you know, you can order like two per person or or whatever, and it takes them like three days to like make one of them, basically, you know, because the the way it goes in stages with the recipe. So that was kind of wild to like participate in. It wasn't like a super long line, but it was still just kind of like, was it worth it? Yeah. I mean, I would say if you've never had it, you know, the original authentic Krona, like it's worth doing. You can actually, he has an online store now set up. So they do a limited number that they'll mail to you. The only issue is like, it's like a, it's like a four pack, but like the cost for the shipping is more than like the cost for the Kronos. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's kind of wild. So every time you're like going to, you know, look at it, be like, oh, that's interesting flavor. And you're like, 
35 bucks for shipping like that's that's rough man i don't think i'm gonna do that yeah i'll stick to the local shops what's the fastest you guys have ever sold out this past weekend 45 minutes we sold like uh sold out completely or the special both special last week was 45 minutes maybe less and it's probably 75 is in between 75 and 85 pastrami sandwiches fast fast like that one was too fast i'm doing it again this weekend what is uh what's today the 11th so it'll be the 13th this saturday uh, we're doing the pastrami again this time uh i'm putting uh some caraway seeds in the roll so remember i told you like we'll always serve it on that roll but we can modify it every so once in a while. I want it to have a little bit more of that rye flavor. So if they, they got to have it last week. But that was too fast, dude, and I hated it. I hated answering the phone. I hated telling people no. There was this one dude that was in line that sent us a DM about how he was at a message on Instagram about his terrible day and all this shit. And then the guy in front of him in line got the last fucking pastrami sandwich. And he was saying it was even worse. So, like, dude, I hate that. It's not like a sneaker where like there's this big company that you have to wait for to make it. It's just food. Like I'll make it again. I promise. You don't don't get so emotional about it. I feel bad. Like I hate it. I hate telling people no. But it's part of business, and I understand. Like, and I hope that people understand is that we don't have anything to do with this stuff after Saturday. So I have to make these things to sell out. And like usually my number is a hundred of specials. Saturday there can be four hundred and fifty upwards to 700 sandwiches pushed out of that joint so it's a good percentage of the daily sales of sandwiches depending on what's going on in the area and how much bread we've gotten and what's going on but it's usually at least 400 now on saturdays which is pretty insane so the fastest we've ever sold out i can't even remember it's probably going to be one of the days in february when we started getting like some local like the 614s and the columbus monthlies and things press there was a day or two it was just like holy shit that was fast probably right after you guys were named like one of the best new restaurants whenever those came out like there was a day we were out like 2 30 or something i think we might have been a little light on our bread load for the day maybe there was a day that we were out like 2 30 or 3 and everybody was happy because like we sold what we bought to sell for the day, you know? And like, I was happy as a, as a business operator. I was like, look, yeah, we might have been able to do double that for the day, but everything that I brought into this building was used and, you know, everybody gets to go home a little bit earlier today. So sweet. With Crew opening their stadium, their new stadium downtown in July, how crazy now are game days? Like you guys got to be selling out earlier than that because especially when there was a couple times in the fall, it was like there was a crew game and like a Clippers game on the same day. We come, we're prepared. I look at the schedule every month now and write every event that's going on at Nationwide, down the road, anything at the convention center that might be appealing to our demographic over here or to the sandwich demographic. We write stuff down on the calendar. I make my guesstimations and I order what I think we're going to need. And, you know, it's okay if we have some leftover stuff. We get creative ways of using it. We eat it ourselves. We might get turned into breadcrumbs. You know, there's times if you're in a pinch and, like, the bread will repurpose properly and we got some friends and family that might be around that wanted a sandwich that we missed, we'll feed them. They'll be understanding of it. But, you know, for the most part, we've just been – I've been stocking up. I, again, dude, I really don't like telling people no. It's awesome when we sell out. But if I got 20 extra pieces of bread every day of the week and we sold everybody what, you know, we fed all the mouths that were hungry for the day, that's like, we're in good shape. Was the original like idea or like maybe even the original like lure of the location was you're in the arena district. So at the time, you know, you could hedge your bets on since you opened during COVID, like how things were going to come back, but you had all the office buildings around. So if everything came back normal, you'd be like this destination lunch spot, but then you could also like sell out on game days too as well because you're right across the street from nationwide and the other two arenas are right down the street like was that kind of like the allure of the location too yeah so the like i said the, the infrastructure for sure that was around it and knowing that yes covid might last in an unpredictable uh, sum of time but when things return and if things return they're gonna have to use all these buildings and put some people inside of them and those people are gonna have to eat at some point in time in the day. So yes, the crew stadium wasn't really like something that was in my crosshairs. 
I'm going to be honest with you. It's the opposite of what I thought. The crew fans have been way more uh, supportive and make it a point to come to the shop. Uh, we get more love from the crew fans than we do from the Jackets fans right now. I think the most Jackets fans, especially with like however many home games we have in between, was it 50 or 60 home games somewhere around there? It's like 41. Uh, so regardless, like that's a lot of games to not come prepared down there for if you're one of those season ticket holders. So. I mean, I wouldn't go buy two beers at the Jackets game and $26, $23 on a cheesesteak and, and spuds across the street. It's a $50 Tuesday night, and the Jackets might lose, you know? They've been playing well, though, so we're, we've been happy to see that. But in the end of it, I was really banking on the Jackets, just what Nationwide Arena was going to provide for us. Concerts, it depends on who's playing. Like, we thought we were going to be a lot busier when 21 Pilots was there across the street because of how popular they are. And, how many people they were drawing, but it was a bunch of kids, you know, it was a lot of kids there and families. And like, you know, we, I know we, we can feed all those different sizes of people and everything, but I think uh, anybody that is familiar with what it is that we do knows that you've got to really like bring your appetite with you or a friend. Why is there no dessert on the menu? There is Grady's goodies. Um, the lady, uh, uh, Brittany with Grady's goodies does the, uh, Oreos. It's not on the menu because it changes. And, um, it's one of those things where like, it gives us, uh, you know, a conversation piece that's not there. And I think it's important to have things up front at the window that are engaging to keep us interested in our guests and their well being, And it just, it helps with the conversation a little bit with the high how are yous and before you check out we just there's little tiny ways of uh putting stuff in front of you that i think will forcibly make you engage with your guests that in in another sense was just like here's this piece of paper what do you want 47 go wait over there uh so i think that's part of it as well so recently a couple months back you were part of the service relief chef auction so for those that don't know service relief matt hagan's and a few other people founded it. It's basically to help support restaurant workers in times of COVID when everybody's getting laid off and stuff like that. They do a lot of stuff or are going to also be doing a lot more stuff with different charities and stuff like that too. But I think they use like 10 chefs in 10 weeks or something. You were one of them, I think in like the second half. Obviously, it's a great organization, all that stuff. But was it nice just to be able to cook contemporary cuisine for once instead of sandwiches? Change your brain over to like, oh, I got to approach this all different like back in the day. Yeah, man. Uh, luckily, I have been able to find time as well to continue to do some of these dinners and uh, of that format of thing separately. So the itch has definitely always been getting scratched even during the months of leading up to opening the sandwich shop in October, because we had use of the space things since June. And we did a few dinners over the summer out on the patio before the sandwich shop had even spawned. We I've done probably four or five of them since we've opened the shop um, spread out here and there besides the service relief dinner. So hell yes, it was fun. Uh, it's always good to scratch the itch and see if you still have that lateral movement creatively that used to be part of your everyday, you know, sort of nightcap is figuring out what's next. What flavors am I going to play with? Working on a dish that like maybe I haven't been able to figure out. Like it looks, it tastes really good, but it looks like throw up or like, you know, just like something like that, you know? So the challenge is always fun. The opportunity to move the mountain or, you know, push the pile, whatever you want to call it, whatever just keeps you going the hammer that hits them any any way you want to put it that stuff's exciting you know the challenge is exciting so always bring it and uh if, if i can continue to do these dinners and those types of things forever i will collaboration with uh especially chefs and different people that i look up to in our community and working with them especially in, in an environment where we all get to cook and do our thing one of the coolest things about food is just the different renditions and how people perceive things and present them. And it's good. Challenging food is good. So is simple sandwiches. What's the key to taking a great sandwich photo? Crosscut. Uh, on Saturdays, I'm responsible for taking the pictures in the morning for the for the sandwiches. So I don't know, man. I just uh, I do my best to 
I'm a big asking a lot of questions and like taking mental notes type of guy. Like I've learned a lot about HVAC units and refrigeration and replacing tiles and fixing toilets and all that kind of stuff throughout my career, just because I'm the idiot who's hovering over the handyman and asking him, why are you doing this? It's the same way with anybody taking photos. You listen, you learn, you log and uh, apply. You know, it's it sounds too easy, but it's sort of like the read and comprehend sort of technique that we all learned when we were five or six or started learning it. You know, it's if you're patient with it and you give anything enough time, be good enough at it that, you know, there's some things that maybe not, but that's okay. But it's just something that I had to learn how to do because at the beginning of all of this, and th- for a good portion of time, I was just doing what I thought was the right thing to do and happy and lucky to have Heidi, uh, have Heart Media run our program now because don't have the bandwidth to answer all the questions on the internet anymore. Uh, it's not something that ever interested me. This is the most time I've spent on my phone in the evening in a while, so I'm happy to uh, be doing it conversing rather than having my face in it. Since you're this big charcuterie guy, assemble the ideal charcuterie board, you know, standard, standard size board, you know, so what, what is that? That's usually like three meats, three cheeses. What's your ideal? Like what's got to be on that board for you? All right. So I think this is a good one. So number one, there's got to be a whole muscle. With those whole muscles, you're going to find me leaning towards uh, w- the top three is going to be one of these three. It's either going to be a copa spicy or mild cured however you'd like but the copa muscle is the king of all cuts inside of the pig and most other animals some sort of cured ham so whether it be the whole ham or whether it be a style of ham called the culatello which comes from the bottom technically the top round of the the pig's leg and uh it's boneless and it's tied up and tongue usually for about a year and a half and some sort of laminate or hog splatter. So one of those three. So a cured ham would come from the leg. So the culatella would come from the leg. The copa comes from the shoulder. One of those three for a whole muscle, some sort of terrine. I love the gelatinous head cheeses. I love a country pate, just really any terrine that was made properly. And the, the meat is soft in texture but still has body. The aspect is treated properly and clarified. Very important things. Uh, Then the number three has got to be, dude, this is tough because I want to put chicken liver mousse on it too because it's like one of my favorite things, but I don't make that in the version of a terrine. So I'm not going to add an honorary extra one, okay? So chicken liver pate is going on there, and you got to have some sort of farce. Uh, a nice saucy sewn sack. I'm a huge fan of soprasada. Just anything that you're really feeling. But I think you should stick to the rubric of whole muscle, terrine, and again, farce. If you're going to have a jam, any jam, literally almost any jam, and chicken liver mousse made properly, that's a quite a combination right there, those two. I think that's very important for a charcuterie board, especially in the modern world, because you see a bunch of bullshit yellow dyed cheeses and flavored this and fucking people putting gummy bears and like there's all kinds of irresponsible practice out there and just like you know it's nice to each their own but like the cheese front stop buying you know some of these like ridiculously flavored cheeses you can't even taste like whether or not there was properly you know raised milk and and good rich fats because the fats and dairy are like some of the most sought after things especially the american palate you know like we love butter we love cheese when you explore it a little bit more and you taste it in more of a raw format with just a little bit of age or you know maybe the right introduction of mold and texture it can be ridiculous so double or triple cream soft ripened cheese can be any one you like if i'm going to be particular about one i love uh there's two cheeses explorator it was named after I think the satellite that we sent the Explorer, I don't know what year it was sent out. That's a fun fact about that cheese. It's called Explorator. I don't know that you can still find it here. It's been a long time since I've seen it. It's something that we used to serve pretty frequently at the market. Delice de Bourgeon. If you go to Lawbird, you will get that cheese with uh, truffle honey fries by Chef Tyler Menace. That's a cheese that I had brought in a long time ago in the case, and we were messing around with it. I think one night, like, 
we were kind of messed up in the kitchen, cleaning up after an event or so. Because when we would go to these events, we'd drink and stuff and have a good time while we were serving food. If we had to do it, we were messing around. And I think Tyler ate, was eating it with potato chips because it's like scoopable, it's like spreadable. And then we it just like, I think that was the moment when like those Delice fries like clicked. It was like a, a fucked up moment in the kitchen like that, which is really cool because Tyler's the man. And I love that he keeps it real with that kind of stuff, but he elevated it, you know, soft cheese, double cream or triple tri- cream, something super, super, super crunchy. When I say cheese, like when I say crunchy, I mean like with the lysine crystal in it. So like, your favorite Gouda, Gouda, there's a Nord Hollander Gouda, there's this, this Appenzeller Swiss that we used to get, I can't remember the name of it, another good hard cheese, Cornish curd, anything that has a good age to it, even if it's just like the king of all cheeses, some hunks of Parmigiano Reggiano, just something with that good crunch and age and maybe that back note of nuttiness, really, really different. And then I love goat's milk. Greek, we eat and enjoy lots of goat cheeses. So I'm going to tell you, tell you to get your favorite chev and whatever jam that you picked out is going to go great with it or preserve and that chicken liver pate. And then make sure you got lots of pickles to eat with all this stuff and some good crusty bread. Will you ever do a New Jersey style cheesesteak on the menu? What is that? Are you okay. All right. So you talking about the cop cheese? No, 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 no. So if you watch, the, it's the Anthony Bourdain episode when he goes to New Jersey. It almost looks like if you took two sides of an English muffin. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've seen that. No, I won't do that. Oh, damn. All right. I might play around with it and figure out how I can make it like a special one day for something. But yeah. All right. Yeah. Something like that. I didn't think it was going to be on the menu, but I just want to like maybe the Saturday special one day we get a we get a New Jersey style. Maybe. I haven't been able to move on from this bread, man. I've been like holding on tight to this bread and the recipe and like just like the origins of it for meant for a few years. So like I want to keep using it because it's just I'll probably stop being so giddy about the bread when somebody else makes in this town makes bread similar to that. The North Market or the West Side Market? West Side Market. Sorry, I love Columbus, but West Side Market shits on the North Market. I figured that was the way you're going to go. No offense to anybody in there or who supports it, but that's just a whole nother beast, man. So you've been cooking in Columbus for you know around a decade or so. How has food in the restaurant industry in Columbus changed since you've been involved? What still needs to change? Where do you see it headed You know, for the rest of this decade coming up? I'd like to see a little bit more foundation built for like cultural cuisine here. We have a lot with our demographic. I feel that from my perspective and from, I think, a few other um, people can agree with me. Columbus is, is a big test market for the most part for some businesses to like, maybe it's after the pop-up sort of working out their kinks here because of the volume of, you know, we get a good reset of people in the suburbs too. Every good six to eight years because of Ohio State, you know? So there's a good amount of people rotating around Um, down there in that demographic. And I think that that's hurt us a little bit because we've become like a test market for some of those fast food and like the more not so passionate sides of the culinary world. And then, you know, there's a positive side was a little place like my shop as a good, you know, good example of a middle ground, I think where, you know, we're doing it the family way, but it's just a time. It's just a little sandwich shop, you know, we're only serving five things. So it's nice to see that it's testing in the fashion that it is in this said market that I'm referring to. I'm saddened by the uh, amount of sort of culture that has settled and like, like Audino's is the oldest probably family business that I know of culturally in the area. And like, they do a great job with their bread. They do a great job with the donuts, but Italian village, there's nothing Italian in it. You know, we don't have like, there's certain parts of towns where, yes, groups, cultures will settle, but there's not like, you know, like the Bethel and the Henderson area over here, like the Kenny area, like you got the Akihana and like that sort of little conglomerate, like Bell's Bread. That's all owned by the same guy, though, you know, so it's a little bit different when, for example, in Cleveland, if you've been to Murray Hill, uh, where, where they call Little Italy in Cleveland, there's everything. From bakeries to 
10, 12 Italian joints to three or four different pizza shops and the old Guido sitting outside drinking the cappuccino or the, the espresso on the front. Like I'd love, I'd love to see some more and help develop and spearhead some more of that culture or that way of doing things in town. Just that style of the community comes together to build what we have to provide more so than like, we're all on our own and like, we don't coincide in very many ways. And this guy does this and that guy does that. And like, that's great and everything, but we need more bakers. We need more butchers. We need more community. I don't know. I hope that through the confidence of whatever comes from Wario's, I can start building a little community like that for, you know, for us. And if it's a start of something, there's many other people that are doing amazing work for the progress of that, whether they know it or not. And, you know, I'm excited to help support. And, you know, now that I have a bit more of a voice, be play a bigger role in, in some of that stuff, I look forward to it. But yeah, man, I, I wish more people would, would settle and would listen and just order things the way that, you know, they've been doing things before you get somewhere and just chop it up because this is the way that I'm used to eating it. It's just like, it's okay. If that's the way that you're used to eating it. But just, I encourage people to, to trust the, the cooks, chefs, or whatever you want to call it a little bit more. And they might actually be comfortable and stick around and you might have some cultural areas in the town then. What's next for you professionally? Would you, I mean, do you see yourself I know you talked about expansion earlier, and that's not really on the horizon for Wario, but, you know, you enjoy doing the pop-up dinners. Do you think you'll ever start a pop-up restaurant or is, you know, I kind of get the vibe that maybe one day you might start a, a small butcher shop. You know, we don't have too many butcher shops in Columbus. I mean, you got the butcher and the grocer. Dan Vargas, I think, opening the Hungarian butcher like this weekend. Yeah, man. We actually just, uh, Tuesday was the soft opening and tomorrow's, uh, it'll be Friday, the 12th of November is the grand opening, but I have uh, some partnership in that, you know, I'll be in and out of there helping in any way that I can, the progression of that thing, you know, it is definitely Dan Varga's baby and he is the Hungarian butcher, but he's been a good friend of mine for a while. And um, when, you know, when he asked me if I'd like to partner in, it, in the f way that he did, I was very happy to do so. I don't know what's next for me. I'm pretty unpredictable. I trust very few people. So it's going to be hard to take on another big project without cost money and trustworthy people and, and a good amount of time. And that's going to deviate me from uh, where I'm at and what I'm doing now, because I do spend a lot of time with Wario's and around it, whether it be, you know, butchering proteins or doing bread things or, you know, whatever it might be, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, uh, pretty much running the administrative part of the business as well. So it'll be interesting to see. I like to stay unpredictable. I'm going to do everything from uh, now until the end of time, the same way that I did Wario's. There's not going to be a big press release. There's not going to be interviews and who's who and what's what. I'm just going to show up one day with whatever it is that my opportunity has presented. And I look forward to earning the respect of the guests the same way that we did with Wario's. Um, if presented opportunities show up and uh, hopefully word of mouth stays strong and uh, people keep talking to each other. Hopefully you hear from somebody that you trust. And that's, I think, the most authentic way to grow a business. It might be a little bit more difficult, but you know, I'm a little crazy, so it's fine. So this question comes from Chef Andrew Smith. Roy's Ave Supper Club, previous guest on the podcast, so left this question behind. What is your favorite chef-owned restaurant in Columbus? It's a tough one, dude. There's not a lot of chef-owned restaurants in Columbus. And this might be one. This might be the one that I'm calling you back on. Which I think I mean, you got Chapman's. You know, BJ's chef-owned. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm the worst at getting out to go eat too. So like, I haven't even gotten the chance to go eat at Chapman's, and I know now that it's like all booked up. Through the holidays, it looked like I was so happy to see that they got a nod from the New York Times. Of that's so huge. That's so huge for our our little Columbus community, man. And hats off to him for working hard and, and bringing that that spotlight here because the food scene here is is truly special. You just have to work a little bit harder, I think, to find it. Yeah, man. I don't know. I, I don't know what how to answer that right now. Who else do we have? I mean, Ray Ray's is chef owned. I would say that that's chef owned, both meat and three, and then the the food trucks. I mean, he started all that stuff. I agree with that 100%. I mean, James is my fucking boy, and he probably eat his food or pick it up more frequently for my guys 
you know, whenever we're doing food trades and stuff than anywhere else. So by default right now, genuinely as well, because I love James's barbecue, probably going to be him. But like, dude, I, I can't think of very many other places. There's not a whole bunch because I mean, you know, Veritas, Dalton owns 1808 and stuff. Yeah. When you start running through it, a lot of it is, you know, and there's still great restaurants that might not be chef owned, but you know, Andrew is pretty specific in that question. So I got to be honest, man, I haven't been to Veritas. I've done very, very little going out and dining and eating. Like I'm a very, like, I suck. Like I, I like to go home and like, just go away. Or I stay at the shop and I got things that I'm working on. Or, but I mean, that's most chefs like don't get out to to other restaurants. It's kind of embarrassing that I, well, I feel like an ass. Uh, okay, here's another one. Preston's. I love Matt's burgers. Tyler Minnis and Boxwood. I love, you know, what he's doing over there with the with the biscuits and with Evan Jones and with Andy and Luke. And uh, I think that. I don't know. It's kind of goofy that the things that I'm naming off, like they're not like sit down full service. Besides Ray Ray's meat and three and like the full service type of things. It's, it's all these people, chefs and cooks who like fucking bailed on the, on the classic fine dining or whatever it is that we were all doing and just like are making literally hamburgers, sandwiches, fried chicken, biscuits, smoking meats is a craft and an art in itself and that's not to dull down anything because we're i think we're all trying to do those things at the height or the highest that they can be done but it's super weird when you think about it like some of my favorite talents in town like we're just doing this really basic shit we're just trying to do it real well. but it's seriously making sandwiches there's might be some work that goes into it because we put it there but again my friend Every single one of those sandwiches on that menu can be found at thousands, probably millions of restaurants in the United States. What's a question you want to leave behind for the next guest? Is a hot dog a sandwich? So we got a handful of more questions for you. Yes, he's everybody who comes on the podcast. So there's a nice compare and contrast across all the episodes. Who would you say is the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far? Brian Polson. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Spoon. One thing in a restaurant that you would not fix yourself? The bar lines. Restaurant you'd recommend that isn't your own? So the scenario I usually give is like person got stuck at the airport, flight got canceled, reach out to you like, hey, where should I go eat? You know, stuck in town for a night. You guys are closed. You point on this direction. It used to be La Scala. I think they closed down after COVID. Where am I going to tell you to go? Polly G's. Bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant. Place that you want to go you haven't been to, place that you want to eat but you haven't been to. Uh, I probably want to go eat at Pujol um, in Mexico, and I would also like to go to, to Copenhagen, Denmark, just to experience that country and eat at Noma and experience that. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? The fryer tipped over, like, while I was on. Legs broke, floor, like, the floor was, like, fucking busted, and it, like, sank into the floor and then just dumped hot fryer grease all over the floor in the middle of the service. We had two fryers. We were fine. We just put a bunch of salt on the floor and kept rocking until we could clean it up. And then the same night, somebody stole 24-quart Cambro of brined chicken thighs for fried chicken out of our walk-in cooler out back. Somebody in Clintonville came in in the same night and stole it, drove off. They had their car parked halfway down the alley, and they, they dipped. So that's, that's a one-two punch. Food or drink guilty pleasure? Is there anything that like you know is terrible for you? You can't stay away from something down like the grocery store aisle. You know you're going through the grocery store and you're like, ah, I gotta kind of not go down that aisle because I know this is down there or fast food or anything like that. I got all the worst guilty pleasures. Like I'm a sucker for a cheese pizza, man. For a good cheese pizza, it's not at the grocery store, but if I see one that looks good, I gotta I gotta have a slice or I gotta order a pie if they don't sell it by the slice. Favorite dish, favorite thing you ever cooked, created? If you look back through your career, you can kind of point to this dish, like when you made it being kind of like almost your aha moment, like you knew you could be a professional chef. Oh, I'm going to call this a confidence boosting dish and something to be proud of. I did this um, this black garlic sausage, agnoloti, and uh, pork confit with a pan sauce that was uh, sort of put together in a different way, explained in a simple way, but very deconstructed and uh, technique driven. And it's definitely something I was very proud of. I can remember like it was yesterday, uh, making that dish. It was a good day. 
I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan. Not everybody is. If you were, is there a moment, episode, scene that always stands out to you about him? If you weren't, was there anybody who is kind of like a culinary personality, you know, whether it's a Guy Fieri or a Julia Child or something like that, that you kind of gravitated towards when coming up? Huge Bourdain fan. Appreciate that you are as well. Saw that doing my research on you. Uh, it's actually in one of his books, in his, in his main book, Kitchen Confidential. He has a line in there and I might butcher it, but he said it's a beautiful thing to see a motley crew of cooks uh, sort of come together and be this uh, wonderful symphony, uh, all working towards the same thing. And please look it up and make the words right for what they should be, because I know I fucked it up, but it's along the lines of that. I think he would appreciate that I was honest enough to just tell you that I fucked it up, but I understand it and I live by it. It's made me appreciate everybody that's walked in my doors who has uh, intention and effort to want to be a positive impact on whatever business or kitchen they're in. And it's all because of uh, that understanding of not being judgmental and just working with what you got. Where can people find you? Social media, website, all that stuff. Plug everything. Wario's Beef and Pork is on Instagram. Myself personally. You're not going to see too much action on my Instagram. Any time that I spend on social media is going to be on that Wario's page for the most part. Come to the sandwich shop. That's where you can find me. I'm always there. and It's 111 Nationwide Boulevard, baby. You can't miss us. we got a big red awning outside. Tuesday to Saturday, 1130 to 7. You can order ahead too, right? Order online if you want. You can call ahead. I suggest you, if you're going to pick it up, call ahead. Don't use the online service. If you're going to pick it up, call, talk to one of us. We're not that bad. You'll save a couple bucks too. Those online things, they always come with fees and shit. So call the shop, call ahead, make yourself comfortable in there as well. Come to the counter, talk some shit. Tell us about your good day or your bad day and we'll give you a sandwich as a consolation prize, no matter what. I mean, I can't say enough about the Wario sandwiches. I mean, I'm probably say I gravitate uh, towards no whiz. I know Daniel Kamel told me I'm wrong. I don't know. I just, I like tasting like the beef and I know everything that, that you put into to getting all that stuff right too. So I want to taste all the flavors, but it's an awesome sandwich. I mean, it's, it's totally worth it if you haven't had it. I mean, it, it's really awesome to see like how it just blew up through just word of mouth and it just became this thing where it was like, you wound up knowing people, everybody kind of heard of it. And it was like, either you knew people that had had it or people that were going to try it at some point and kept saying like, Oh, I got to try it. I got to try it. And eventually do. So yeah, man, it's, it's been an awesome success and congrats to you guys and everything you're doing. And can't wait to see uh, whenever you come out with that New Jersey style uh, cheesesteak on that special. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I appreciate you uh, having interest in having me on tonight. I just want to, uh, to say thank you to my team. Thank you to everybody that has been out there to support us. We're not here without you guys, all the gentlemen at the shop. Nate, Zeph, Kevin, Cristo, Neftali, Ruben, and of course, Miss B. Thank you guys for your dedication and your hard work. That's it for me, man. I appreciate you, Ray. A big thanks again to Chef Stefan Medias for coming on the podcast, taking some time out of one of his off nights or after closing up, coming on and chatting about Wario's and inspiration for it, where it comes from. So again, if you've never had it, it's located across from Nationwide Arena where the Blue Jackets play, downtown Columbus, right across the street. Can't miss it. Big red sign and everything like that. They got the walk-up window. You can also pop inside. Call ahead to order. A handful of different sandwiches. They do the Saturday special. Sometimes there's a line for that too as well. And that usually sells out pretty quick. So if you're interested in the Saturday special and they post it on Instagram, you want to make sure that you call, get your order in, and get down there as soon as you can. It's amazing stuff. Some of the best sub sandwiches, cheesesteaks that we got here in Columbus, Ohio. So really happy that he didn't fall out of the industry and is still around and they're doing awesome food and, and awesome stuff over there. So again, make sure to follow them on Instagram at Stefan Medias and also at Wario's Beef and Pork. Make sure to follow us on Instagram too as well at Spoon Mob. Uh, you can check out our website, spoonmob.com. Email us question, comments, feedback, either through the website, there's a contact portal, or directly spoonmob at yahoo.com. Check out past episodes of the podcast. We recently posted a whole bunch of stuff. We did kind of wrap up with 2021 and everything like that. That's all out there in the feed. So if you haven't listened to it, make sure to check that out. But every Thursday, chefs and guest episodes, Wednesdays are parts down known where me and Ben um, kind of watch 
Uh, we're watching in chronological order the Anthony Bourdain parts unknown series and we're just kind of going through the episodes so you know recently kind of did montana uh, the greek islands so we're in the middle of that season there so you know we talk about the episode but then also kind of current events and, and random stuff too as well so you know if you're looking for a podcast that's pretty entertaining that would probably be one i would recommend checking out yeah appreciate everybody listening uh, we got big things planned for 2022 also if you're interested in learning more about uh, chef medias uh, check out I think it was the December issue of Columbus Monthly. They had a profile on there. And then also the Meat Bucket podcast. Uh, he was on a few months ago too as well. And the Meat Bucket's a little different than what we do. They do talk about their career, the chef's career, whoever the, their guest is, but they also do kind of like a tasting. Um, so they kind of went through the four or five uh, different sandwiches that they have at Wario's and kind of broke them down and everything. So it's a pretty cool podcast. So check them out. They've had BJ Lieberman on doing matzo ball soup. They had Tony Tanner on. I think one of their first episodes was from who's the owner of Butcher and Grocer and Cleaver. Um, they had him on and and they've had a bunch of other people on. They do kind of like one, I think it's like one guest episode a month or something like that. So check them out if you're interested to learn a little bit more about kind of the food scene and stuff. It's a little different style podcast. So, you know, definitely check them out. We like to support other podcasts, you know, too, as well that we find interesting. So, but that's it for this week. We will talk to you guys next week.